1 Kings 18 1-46, through the Bible. Chapter 18. Theme, Elijah vs. the Prophets of Baal. This is one of the most spectacular chapters in the Scriptures. Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal to a contest to determine who is really God. The prophets of Baal, all 450 of them, are about an even match for this one man Elijah. He is a great man. Elijah and Obadiah. And it came to pass after many days, that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab. And there was a sore famine in Samaria, 1 Kings 18 1-2. God is ready to use Elijah. This man can now step out with boldness, he has learned that he is nothing and God is everything. He goes out to meet Ahab, and he is prepared. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so, when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took an hundred prophets, and hid them by fifty in a cave, and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land, unto all fountains of water, and unto all brooks, peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself, 1 Kings 18 3-6. The famine was now in the acute stage. Much of the vegetation had dried up and the cattle could no longer find places to graze. So Ahab and his servant, Obadiah, set out in search of possible pasture land. Ahab went one direction and Obadiah went another. Now Obadiah was the governor of Ahab's palace. He was a God-fearing man, and he had hidden one hundred prophets of God from Jezebel's wrath. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and fell on his face, and said, Art thou that my lord Elijah? And he answered him, I am, go, tell thy lord, behold, Elijah is here, 1 Kings 18 7-8. While Obadiah was looking for grazing sites, he met Elijah. Elijah told him to tell the king, Behold, Elijah is here. My, how we need a voice like Elijah's today. I believe he is coming back in the last days after the church leaves the earth. This earth will need a strong voice then, and it will have one in Elijah. And he said, What have I sinned, that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab, to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom, whither my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said, He is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation, that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, Go, tell thy Lord, Behold, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not, and so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me, but I thy servant fear the Lord from my youth. Was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid an hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave, and fed them with bread and water? 1 Kings 18 9-13 Obadiah does not want to deliver Elijah's message as he is afraid that Elijah will disappear before Ahab sees him. Obadiah is fearful for his own life, and he makes it very clear that he does not want to do what Elijah has asked. And now thou sayest, Go, tell thy Lord, Behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. And Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab, and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah, 1 Kings 18 14-16. We have read the message three times now, Behold, Elijah is here. With Elijah's assurances that he will certainly meet Ahab, Obadiah goes to the king. And you know what this man said? He said, Behold, Elijah is here. And that will be the message again some day. Elijah's challenge to Ahab. And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubled Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou, and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. 1 Kings 18 17-18. Elijah said to Ahab, I am not the one who is troubling Israel, you are. 
Elijah's kind of preaching cannot be misunderstood. It is not double talk, it is telling it like it is. Before we go any further, I want to say that the liberal is always blaming the fundamentalist for causing division in the church. But who really caused it? The church held very fundamental beliefs at one time. Who brought bifurcation into the church? Who was it that led the church away from its foundation? The liberal did. I have been accused of leaving my former denomination, but I did not, my denomination left me. I still have the same beliefs that I had at the beginning. Unfortunately, my denomination has departed from those historic beliefs. It has always been the custom of the liberal to blame any trouble in the church on the fundamentalist. The liberal is never to blame. In the same way Ahab blames Elijah for the problem in the land. He accuses Elijah of stirring things up. The word of God will always stir up things. The interesting thing is that rats will always scurry to a dark corner when the light is turned on. Then Elijah challenged Ahab to a contest between himself and the prophets of Baal. Now therefore send, and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal four hundred and fifty, and the prophets of the groves four hundred, which eat at Jezebel's table, 1 Kings eighteen nineteen. The contest was actually won between the Lord and Satan, between the worship of the living God and the worship of Baal. Outwardly it was a battle of Ahab and Jezebel with the 450 prophets against Elijah. Elijah, however, was worth a whole army. The Lord versus Baal at Mount Carmel. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people, and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word, 1 Kings 18 20-21. The people of Israel have assembled at Carmel. It is going to be quite a contest. Elijah knew what was in the hearts of the people. They were pretending to worship the living and true God, but they were also worshipping Baal. The reason the people did not answer Elijah is that they were guilty of sin. It is that type of devil talk, a two-faced way of life, that today has become so abhorrent and is a stench in the nostrils of God. The double standard of many Christians has turned off many people as far as the church is concerned. If the average unsaved man knew the church as I know it today, I have my doubts that he would ever darken the door of a church. If there ever was a place where things should be made clear and plain, simple and forthright, it is in the church. Unfortunately, that is where there is more double talk and beating around the bush than any place else. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are four hundred and fifty men, 1 Kings 18 22. Elijah had what I am pleased to call an Elijah complex, some of us develop that even today. Many times in my ministry I feel that I am the only one left. Then I find out that there is a preacher in a hollow in Tennessee, or on the side of a hill in Georgia, or down around a lake in Florida, or up in the mountains of California, or in the suburban areas of Chicago who is standing for God and paying a bigger price than I have ever paid. Then I just get rid of my Elijah complex and thank God that there are men standing for God and His Word in these days in which we are living. Now I recognize that there are many big-name preachers that you hear about but who are not actually standing for God. Instead they are pussyfooting around. They are trying to compromise. I heard one preacher give a certain message in one part of the country and then turn around in another part of the country and practically reverse his message. There is something wrong when you can't give the same message everywhere. There is something wrong with the message or with the man who gives it. Elijah says to the people of Israel, I am the only one who is standing for God. Now he was wrong, there were 7,000 people hiding in the hills who had not bowed the knee to Baal. I never cared too much for that crowd but at least they did not worship Baal. Elijah did not even know about them. If Elijah had been on the radio in those days, he never would have received a letter from any of those folk. It is too bad that they did not encourage him a little bit, but they did not. Elijah continues his message to the people and his challenge to the prophets of Baal. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under, and call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. 
And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken, 1 Kings 18 23-24. In other words, Elijah said, Let us taste of the Lord and see whether he is good or not. If Baal is God, then let us worship him. And if he is not, then let's kick him out. If the Lord God is the living God, we want to know. My friend, today God wants you to know him. Although you may have doubts, if you're sincere and really want to know him, he will reveal himself to you, because God wants you to know. Faith is not groping in the dark, our faith rests upon facts. Your salvation depends on your believing those facts and trusting Christ. Notice what is going to take place. I think this is one of the most dramatic scenes in Scripture. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leapt upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon, that Elijah mocked them, and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God, either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth, and must be awakened. And they cried aloud, and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets, till the blood gushed out upon them, 1 Kings 18 25-28. The prophets of Baal put on quite a performance. Elijah just sits there and watches them at first with a good deal of cynicism. They begin to call upon Baal. Nothing happens. They jump on the altar, and that doesn't help. They become fanatics. They display a lot of emotion. Their actions become almost hysterical. Finally, they begin to cut themselves, and the blood gushes out. They are sure this will stir Baal to action. Old Elijah says to them, Say, it may be that he has gone on vacation and you will have to wait until he comes back. Or maybe he is taking his afternoon siesta and you are going to have to yell louder to wake him up. Elijah has a big time during their performance. And all the while the people of Israel are watching. It is John Knox, by the way, who is credited with the statement, one with God as a majority, and he knew the accuracy of that statement by experience. Elijah also learned this truth through experience in his day when there had been a wholesale departure of the northern kingdom from God. Under Ahab and Jezebel there was almost total apostasy, Elijah pretty much stood alone. It is true that there were 7,000 people who had not bowed to Baal, but they had retreated to the mountains. Not one of them stood with Elijah. He was not aware that they even existed until God told him. Elijah took a stand against calf worship. You might say he took a stand against new morality and rock music in the church. He took exception to many of the things that were going on and refused to compromise with the prophets of Baal. When they wrote a new confession of faith and rejected the authority of the Word of God, he was opposed to them. It was Dr. Wilfred Funk who said that the most bitter word in the English language is alone. Elijah stood alone. He did not voice public opinion, friend. He was no echo, he was no parrot. He was not promoting anyone else. He was no politician. He was more concerned about pleasing God than courting the popularity of the crowd. He sought divine approval rather than public applause. He was not a clown in a public parade. He was a fool for God's sake. He was a solo voice in the wilderness of the world. He carried on an all-out war against Satan and his hosts. He stood alone, arrayed against the prophets of Baal. Elijah chose Mount Carmel to take a dramatic stand for God. Several years ago I stood in what is probably the exact area where Elijah and the prophets of Baal held their contest. Mount Carmel overlooks the Bay of Haifa and the Blue Mediterranean Sea. It is a long ridge, and way out yonder to the east is Megiddo in the valley of Estrelon. In this dramatic spot the lone, majestic figure of Elijah stood apart. He was detached. I think he looked bored after a few minutes of the performance by Baal's prophets. Then that ironic smile crossed his face and you could hear the acid sarcasm in his voice. He used the rapier of ridicule. He taunted and jeered at these prophets. And finally, with wilting scorn, he waved them aside. And it came to pass, when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice, nor any to answer, 
nor any that regard it. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down, 1 Kings 18 29-30. Elijah is now going to have to depend on God. The altar of the Lord has been broken, and Elijah spends some time cementing it together. That was a dramatic move, friend. What is it that has caused division in our country today? I recognize that there are many explanations being offered, but a departure from God is basic to the divisions in this nation. There was a time that there was a measure of unity, and it was a unity based on the fact that there is a living God, that is written in our Constitution, and we are responsible to Him. There was a time when this nation believed that the Bible was an authority. Who divided this country? Those, my friend, who began to cut up the Word of God. That is what caused the division. It is hypocrisy today when so many are saying, let's get together. Get together on what, my friend? You cannot get together on nothing. It is like the story that is told about a man who was walking through the jungle in Africa, and he met an elephant. The elephant said to him, where are you going? The man replied, I am not going anywhere. The elephant said, I'm not going anywhere either. Let's go together. That is the only way you are going to get together with today's crowd, you will have to agree on nothing. If you do that, you can all get together. My friend, you can't get together unless you've got something to gather around that will hold you together. The altar was the place of unity. Elijah put it back together. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name, and with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood, 1 Kings 18 33 Notice that Israel was one nation. It was not Israel and Judah, or Samaria and Jerusalem, but all twelve tribes as the one nation, Israel. So Elijah built an altar in the name of the Lord. Then he made a trench around the altar, put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces. Finally he ordered that four barrels be filled with water and poured on the sacrifice and on the wood. Now it was a long way down to the water supply. As I stood on Mount Carmel, I wondered how long it took those who were bringing the water to get four barrels up the side of that mountain. It was a long route, but Elijah was in no hurry. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water, 1 Kings 18 34-35. They fetched the water once, and Elijah said, Go down and fill it again. And that was not enough. He said, do it the third time, and they did it the third time. I think if you could have seen Elijah that day there would have been a wry smile on his face. Do you know what that wry smile was about? Why did he pour water on that altar? My friend, only God can do the impossible. A little water won't keep the fire from falling, so he did not mind pouring the water over everything. He could have poured water for the next 24 hours, and the fire still would have fallen. Elijah is learning to depend on God, we have seen that. Remember, as he stood at that little brook and watched it dry up, he knew he was nothing in the world but a channel through which water could flow. He had also looked down in an empty flower barrel and sung the doxology. God fed Elijah, the widow, and her son out of that empty flower barrel for the period of the drought. And then he found out he was a dead body. He had learned that if anything was going to be done, God has to do it. He just stood up there that day, a wry smile on his face, I think Elijah had a sense of humor. And I know God has a sense of humor. Under his breath Elijah probably said, Lord, if you don't do it, it won't be done. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near, and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word, 1 Kings 18 36. Friend, I wish we recognized the fact that if God doesn't do it, 
It's not going to be done. Do you understand Elijah's prayer? This is one of the great prayers of Scripture, it's not long, but it is great. He said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, you will notice that Elijah used the term Israel, not Jacob. Why Israel? Well, Israel is the name that was given not to twelve tribes, but to one nation. Also in his prayer Elijah said, Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. You and I need to be sure that what we are doing is according to the will of God. Don't do something that you want to do and then ask God to bless it. God doesn't move that way. You have to go his route if you want to receive the blessing. We have no right to demand anything of God. It is true that He demands a great deal of us, but we are not to demand anything of Him. He is not a Western Union boy. He will not come at your command. We are to pray according to His will. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that Thou art the Lord God, and that Thou hast turned their heart back again. 1 Kings 18:37. Elijah is praying for the glory of God in this verse. That is what moves the arm of God. And do you know what happened? Then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is the God, the Lord, He is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and slew them there, 1 Kings 18 38-40. That was a pretty brutal thing to do, wasn't it? But it sure got rid of the apostasy and the heresy. Elijah's Prayer for Rain And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain, 1 Kings 18 41. When the people turned to God, the rain came and the blessings came. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth, and put his face between his knees. And said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up, and looked, and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time, that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile, that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode, and went to Jezreel, 1 Kings 1842-45. Elijah was a great man. And so that the people might realize that the drought was not just an accident of nature but was a disciplinary measure, it ended the same way that it had begun, by the command of God's man, Elijah. Elijah said that rain was coming, but at first nothing could be seen but blue water and blue sky. When his servant looked for the seventh time, however, a cloud as small as a man's hand could be seen. The cloud rapidly increased in size until the heavens were black and rain flooded the parched earth. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins, and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. 1 Kings 18:46. Elijah had told Ahab to hurry home because the creek would soon rise and he would not be able to cross it. But then Elijah began to run. Why? Because he is a man of like passion as we are. He is very much a human being, and we are going to see just how human he is.